Well, good evening and welcome to Dome at Home. Joining us on another Thursday evening, unfortunately a cloudy night, at least here in Winnipeg, where we're broadcasting from. Hopefully you'll have some clear skies where you are. My name is Scott Young. I'm the Planetarium Astronomer at the Manitoba Museum, and I'll be your host. Our program is sponsored by Steinbeck Credit Union. Thanks very much. They're uh, the folks that make us able to make the show for you every week, and it's great to be, uh, be uh, involved with them. With me as always is Mike. He's out there in chat land. He's monitoring our chats here. He's over on social media, looking at questions and so on. We're on um, Zoom, Facebook Live and YouTube Live. And I know he's just getting all the things set up in those chats there. Uh, Mike, are you uh, around yet? Yeah, I'm right here. Hello, Scott. Hello, audience. Hello. Yeah, nice to see you. I uh, I jumped at, I, I threw to you a little bit too early there. I, I didn't want you to be typing and uh, and talking at the same time. Um, you, you've been, uh, you're also the guy that checks a lot of the mail that comes in. Uh, has anything come in in the last little while? Uh, you know what, honestly, it's been a little quiet. Uh, you know, I know we get a couple of our regular viewers uh, sending us a few uh, of their uh, their shots that they've taken of some of the sky events that they're looking at. Uh, some of them just selfies of them looking up into the sky, um, but uh, it's actually been a little bit quiet. So if anybody wants to shoot us an email at uh, space at manitobamuseum.ca, uh, we'd love to hear what you think of the program and what you've been doing to look up into the night sky. Yeah, exactly. It's always great to get mail. And um, we're still working our way through the great set of mail that Oakenwald School sent us in. We'll be answering some more of those questions later on in the show. We've got a lot to cover this week, so we're going to jump right into our Skywatch portion where we look at what's up in the sky, what you can see this week in terms of the stars, the planets, the constellations, and so on. You know, I had my rant about daylight savings time back when that started. It, we're still seeing that effect. It doesn't get dark until really late. It used to be you could go out after the show, it would already be dark, and you could see whatever we had talked about. Not so much anymore. Now we're at the point where basically... You know, sunset happens just a little bit before nine o'clock, which is a long time. So if we just step through here, we're again using uh, Stellarium, our wonderful uh, planetarium free downloadable program here. After the sun goes down, you know, it's, it's like quarter after nine, 930 before it really starts to get dark. And the first star you're going to see if you have a clear horizon is going to be the planet Venus. It's gotten a little bit farther away from the sun in the last week. It's gotten a little higher in the sky, and that makes it a little bit easy to see, easier to see. It's very, very bright. It'll be the first thing that shines through the twilight, but it is very low. So if you don't have a nice flat horizon like this one, if you're behind trees or buildings or things like that, you're going to have a little bit of trouble. Venus is only visible for a short period of time, and as the sky gets darker, it gets brighter, but it gets lower because Venus also sets just like the sun does. But right around uh, here we are at quarter to 10. This is a good time to really start looking. If you have a nice clear horizon to the Northwest, Venus has gotten nice and bright, it's still low. And just above it and to the left, you can start to see the planet Mercury coming into view. Mercury is still sort of at its best nice and far away from the uh, from the sun. And we basically this whole week, we'll have a good view of catching the planet Mercury. And as the night goes on, everything will sort of disappear into the uh, into the west. A few more stars start coming out, but then we wind up losing sight right around. Uh, here's this. Here's the view at 10 o'clock. Venus is right on the horizon. If you don't have a perfectly flat horizon out on the prairie or something, it's probably gone by 10 o'clock for you. Here we are at uh, right around uh, just a few minutes after 10. I'm just gonna swing us over here to the west. While Venus is going down in the Northwest, there's something that's starting to come up in the, um, oops, that's the wrong button, darn it. In the uh, sort of Southwest tonight, if you have clear skies, you will have a good view of the International Space Station. Here, I'll just reset this here, there we go. The space station basically looks like Venus, a very, very bright star, but if you watch it carefully, it's actually moving. 
when it when it appears above the horizon it'll be moving sort of slowly because it's it's kind of coming in towards us and starting to lift off but as time goes on it will get higher and higher and then it'll start moving across the sky very quickly we're in a period of time where you can see the international space station two or three times a night every night usually around any time from sunset to uh, to the morning, really, but usually around midnight, there's a, there's a good pass. Unfortunately, the, the paths that it takes, the time that it comes over is different every single night. So if you wanna know what the forecast is, like I, I know I'm gonna miss this 10 o'clock one because it's totally cloudy here. You can visit the Manitoba Museum's uh, webpage, manitobamuseum.ca, click over to the planetarium section, and there in the current night sky, we have not only what's up in the sky, but we've got a link that will predict when the space station is coming over for your location. It really is a spectacular thing to see. And it's cool to think that that little dot has seven people living on it. So if we don't have a, if you don't get the chance to see it tonight, tomorrow, next night, anytime, we've got a great time, uh, great ability to, to see the station for the next little while. And Mike has just dropped the uh, direct link to the Manitoba Skies page in the chat here in Zoom. And that will uh, get you're right to the area where it'll do the predictions for you. All right, so I'm, I'm just gonna jump ahead just a little bit because one of the cool things about the space station passes right now, usually one of them goes right overhead and you wind up seeing this bright star-like object going right overhead. And if you've been watching the show, you know that right overhead at this time is the Big Dipper. Let's uh, zoom out a little bit. There's our Big Dipper right in here. And the space station basically goes right through the bowl of the Big Dipper or very close to it at least once a night. So that makes it really, really easy to spot. I mean, it's nice and bright. It goes right overhead. It goes right through the Big Dipper. Sort of all the things have lined up that, to make it easy to spot. Okay, let's take a look back at our constellations. We'll go back to our view here. There we go. Off in the south, we have the moon starting to dominate the night. It's been a nice crescent for the last week or so, it's starting to get more towards almost a half moon or a quarter moon, as we say, the first quarter. And between now and next week, we're coming up to full moon. We'll get more uh, about the full moon, the super moon, uh, in just a little bit. But the same constellations that we've been talking about, they're all still there. We've got Leo the lion, the moon is right underneath Leo's tail right now. It'll head over into Virgo the maiden next and on to Libra, all those zodiac constellations stretched out in a line. That's where the moon will be, basically be, be moving. Off in the east, we have at uh, 10 o'clock, there's the space station still going down. It's uh, still in the middle of its past that we're seeing here. Look how much brighter it is than even Vega, one of the brightest stars in the sky. It just really stands out. In fact, even if it's cloudy, if it's thin cloud, you can see the space station through the clouds. That's how bright it is. We've got Hercules over here, the uh, Boates, the ice cream cone. We're finally starting to be able to see Cygnus, the swan, rising up here. Cygnus is a uh, summertime constellation, the Milky Way goes right through it. So it's a good marker. The, the bright star Deneb is at the tail of the swan here. And this is the, the swan's body. And this is its nose and beak. So its neck is sort of stretched way out. And on either side, it's got wings made of these stars here. So it kind it, okay, it kind of looks like a, like a swan maybe. It certainly is also called the Northern Cross because if you just use these stars here, it looks pretty much like a cross as well. Back in the north, the sky is still pretty bright in the north. It does not get very dark in the northern part of our sky because the sun barely goes down below the horizon before it goes and starts rising again over in the northeast. So the northern sky at this time of year, it's going to be hard, even harder to see some of the stars. But you still have the things like uh, the, nor the north star always in the same spot. And then high, high, high overhead, our Big Dipper up here. In the west, we've kind of been ignoring the constellations because it's all planet action now. But um, Gemini, the twins, is still up there. And Gemini is still important because there's Mars still hanging on, 
cruising around in the constellation of Gemini. The last week, we were hoping to have a, a telescope night with uh, the moon and Mars right next to each other. Unfortunately, we were clouded out and the other two sites across Canada that we were sort of linked in with to, to see their telescopes instead, they were also clouded out. We'll get, we'll get some telescope stuff going though. So um, lots of things to see just in the, the regular constellations, the, the dance of the planets. You've got those three planets in the, in the evening sky plus the moon. And uh, when we get to the morning sky, you'll see a little bit more there. Now, something I wanna do is talk about an event that will happen before our next show. You've probably already seen the ads for the super flower blood moon, which is basically a lunar eclipse that will be happening at the same time as a super moon. Now you might think, oh, big, you know, big deal. It turns out that lunar eclipses always happen at full moon. That's kind of a requirement. And super moons also by definition always happen at full moon. So once a, whenever there's a lunar eclipse, you've got like a one in 12 chance that it's also gonna be a super moon. So it's not really that rare. And the flower moon is simply the name of the full moon in May. So that happens every year too. Regardless, if you string enough adjectives together, people click on the, on the uh, posts. So I guess it's a, it's a good marketing hook. The moon though is going to be a difficult target for us here in Manitoba. The eclipse actually doesn't start until around 3.30 in the morning, our time. So let me just get us forward to about 3.30. Actually, we'll, we'll go more to, uh, this is a bit about four o'clock. The moon is already setting low in the Southwest by the time the moon, by the time the eclipse starts. And at this particular time of the year, the, the full moon doesn't get very high in the sky anyway. So you're really, again, you're gonna need that nice clear horizon. If you really wanna see this, find yourself a Western horizon out on the West edge of the city maybe, or someplace where you've got a nice flat horizon without any trees or anything like that. And actually we're gonna just flip over to some uh, static images that I created earlier. Right around five in the morning on the night of Tuesday, May 25th. So the morning of Wednesday, May 26th, excuse me. That's when the eclipse is happening. And this is how much of the moon is eclipsed. It's a partial eclipse when we can see it. And by a little bit later in the evening, actually let's go to a place with a better horizon. There we go. You can sort of see there's a little notch out of the left side of the moon. It looks a little bit darker. Only 20 minutes later, the moon is almost half covered, but it's also half as high off the ground. This is really close to the horizon. If there's any haze or things like that, you just won't get a good view of it. So the lunar eclipse for Manitobans, I wouldn't say it's a bust, but it's not gonna be as good as some of the ones that we have had in the, uh, in the past. If you wanna get up for it, I highly encourage you to find a good place where you know you'll have a, a good horizon and get there early. And I mean, the moon's always fun to look at. If you have binoculars, take them along. If you don't, that's fine too. The, the, the shadow of the moon should be interesting. What'll be cool though, is as the moon sets, it's going more and more into eclipse. And as the moon is down low, you, um, you wind up having um, the moon sort of get reddish colored anyway. So it could be a very dramatic, very colorful event. And here's sort of just a close up of the, of the shadow of the earth being cast on the moon. That's really what's happening there. So that, that happens coming up this Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. I always like to make sure that people realize it's, it's the morning because I've had people call me the next night and say, hey, the eclipse isn't happening because they just looked at the date. So Tuesday night, the 25th, Wednesday morning, the, the 26th. We're gonna try and live stream it, but you know, it's one of those things that we may or may not be able to do just because of weather. That'll be over on my personal page, uh, Scott the Sky Watcher on Facebook, because uh, it's hard to set up a big event through the museum's page. And then if it doesn't come off, it's kind of a problem. So this is just like a test. And uh, hopefully we'll get a good view. So that's going to be coming up. Oops, that's going to be coming up uh, next week. So probably one of the better events to watch for. Where, there we go. Now, if you are gonna be up early in the morning, 
the moon is going to be over there in the west. Well, over in the east, you've got some planets coming up. If you're up at four or five in the morning, brilliant Jupiter is going to be rising over in the southeast, really, really bright. And then it's also fairly bright, probably the brightest star in the area, but not as bright as Jupiter. We've got the planet Saturn. So those two planets, again, they're rising early enough. They're starting to get high enough that by morning time, you can actually get a decent view of them. We are going to be um, special or taking a good look at Jupiter today as our main uh, main feature. Mike, do you have any questions out there? I've been seeing a bunch of stuff go through in chat, so I'm not sure if there's any uh, anything coming in. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of questions that I'm, I'm going to hold off because I, I know you're going to be talking about some things uh, later. So um, for anybody who's not getting their question answered right away, please be patient. Uh, Melissa's asking, and I, I have to admit, I don't know a lot about uh, tides and how they work, but uh, she was asking, do you know if um, it, which I'm assuming she's talking about the eclipse, uh, will cause a king tide or a low perigean spring tide? The, I'm not too sure about the terminology. Yeah. I'm not too sure if you know it either. Yeah, you know, um, the, the low perigean spring tide, um, I believe will happen this time around because the perigee is basically when the, the moon is a little closer to the earth, that's the closest point to the earth. And that's what happens during a supermoon. So those are the kinds of things that are associated with sort of the supermoon. It's not the eclipse itself. It's the fact that the, the moon's a little closer to us during its full phase. And so at times like that, the effects of the sun and the effects of the moon sort of, um, in this case, counteract each other. And it means that the, the high tide is at a low point, which is kind of a weird way to say it. But yeah, you can have this, this, kind, of, uh, this kind of effect. I'm not as up as, on tides as, uh, as I could be because uh, I think I'm literally as far from an ocean as you can get in the, in the country, unfortunately. Yeah. But, I'm the same uh, yeah. way. I'm trying to research it myself as we're talking here. And yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I just realized I know very little about tides. So um, maybe yeah. we could um, move to uh, Jasmina's question from Facebook. Uh, they've asked, uh, how many lunar eclipses are there in a year? Well, that's a really good question. It depends. Um, there's uh, There can be as many as four or five, but most years there's one or two. Um, sometimes three, and then sometimes um, they're only partial eclipses or they're not visible from our half of the earth or whatever. So this is the first um, total lunar eclipse that's uh, been around for about a year and a half. And unfortunately, we just don't get a good view of it. Now, the cool thing about eclipses is they do come in pairs. So two weeks after a lunar eclipse or two weeks before, depending on how it works, is a solar eclipse. And so that's what we've got this time. May 26 is our lunar eclipse. June the 10th is our partial solar eclipse. And we'll be talking more about that coming up in the, uh, in the coming shows as we get closer to that. Excellent. And one more quick question, just because I'm, I'm always excited to get a question on YouTube. Uh, we don't get a lot of questions through that, uh, uh, that streaming service. But uh, Cortland is asking, how long will it take before our night sky will not look the same for people in the future? Well, um, the stars do move relative to each other so that the constellations will change, but it happens very, very slowly. Basically, over the you know thousands of years that we've been watching the sky, pretty much nothing has moved unless you could use a telescope to really measure it. The, the constellations look the same as people would have seen thousands of years ago, and it'll take tens of thousands of years for even a few of the stars to move much. So it's a really, really slow process. Um, so it'll be interesting, you know, even now people don't know what a dipper is when we talk about the Big Dipper because we don't have well water, most of us anymore. What are they gonna think about it in 5,000 years where our technology has advanced or whatever and we're still using the name, the Big Dipper. I, I hope we'll update them in some way. Great questions. And uh, we will get to more in the Q&A section. I just saw so many going through there that I wanted to, uh, wanted to chat a little bit. Um, now, the planet Jupiter, like I say, is coming up. We've been watching Mars every week. We will check in with Percy and Ginny on Mars again, but I want to um, talk a little bit about Jupiter because Jupiter 
is a really cool planet. It's a beautiful planet to see in a telescope. It's one of the best planets to look at with a telescope because you can actually see the clouds of it. You can see these stripes that go across. You can see the great red spot, which uh, in this picture is actually more of a sort of pale orange spot over here. Lots of other storms and things like that. You can see some of the moons of Jupiter. It really is a fascinating planet. And we've got a great spacecraft. Well, we've been studying Jupiter with spacecraft since the 70s. This is, this is from the Voyager spacecraft in uh, 1979 and sort of give, gives a sense of the, the dynamic atmosphere of Jupiter and how the storms are going around and how everything's moving. But recently we've had a new spacecraft there, which is called uh, Juno. And Juno has been orbiting Jupiter for a number of years, getting close up pictures, diving right close to Jupiter and then coming around the outside. It gets within only a couple thousand kilometers of the clouds of Jupiter at the surface. And so it gets images like this where as it goes in on its orbit, it's getting basically better views than the weather satellites that we have here on Earth, except here we're looking at the weather in the giant, um, the gas giant planet Jupiter. So Jupiter is a what we call a gas giant. It is a thousand times bigger than the Earth. So that's the giant part. And it's made of gases or clouds, uh, mostly hydrogen, maybe three quarters hydrogen, one quarter helium, and then a few other things mixed in there. There's methane and there's all sorts of other things. Um, so uh, we did say that we're going to answer some of the questions uh, when we get to them. So I'll uh, ask you to please not repeat the question 95 times. Thanks. Um, we do have um, these, these planets, uh, these clouds and things like that um, are visible in telescopes, but the Juno spacecraft just gave this amazing view of, uh, of the, the, the things that we can see. Like I say, it's a gas giant planet. The outside is, is clouds and gas. It probably transitions to sort of liquid a little bit deeper down where the, uh, the clouds are just compressed so much that they sort of turn into a soup. There might be a little bit of rock at the middle, but probably a very, very small amount. And it is uh, a really, really interesting world, not just so much for the, the planet itself, but it has a retinue of other worlds that go around it. It has a whole bunch of moons that are in orbit. Some of these moons might as well be planets themselves, quite honestly, because they're they're bigger than the planet Mercury. So we'll uh, we'll just take another look here as we go along. There we go. There's our great red spot close up from the Juno spacecraft. It, it really is, it, it's basically a giant hurricane or a tornado kind of storm swirling around. It's been there for at least 400 years. Galileo saw um, later on in his career, not with his first telescope, but he saw it a little bit later on. And then in the early 17, uh, late 1600s, it was seen as well. Jupiter has 79 moons. And we're just gonna talk about a few of them tonight but each one is pretty much like a planet. If these moons went around the sun, instead of going around Jupiter, we would definitely call them planets. They're, they're big, but they orbit Jupiter. This is a sort of an animation of them zooming around Jupiter. Some, they go different speeds and so on. This is kind of the kind of view you can get in a small telescope. You can wind up seeing these moons. Obviously this is like a sped up version, but you can see these moons moving to either side of the planet. Even in binoculars, you can see them and they look like tiny little stars that are lined up on either side. So there's our binocular challenge. Get out and take a look at Jupiter, see if you can spot the moons. So we're gonna go through the four moons really, really quickly because each one of them is crazy. This is, this is Io. Io is the closest of the four big moons and it is a volcano moon. It covered with active volcanoes all over the place. These things are erupting lava. Now. Here's a comparison of size with Earth, our moon, and, and Io. We've talked about the moon before. There's no volcanoes on the moon. The moon's too small to keep the heat going in the, in the inside. And so that has made it very dead. There's no volcanoes. There's no activity there. What's up with Io that it's the same size and yet it's got all this volcano? Well, it's very close to Jupiter. And Jupiter's gravity can actually 
be a heat engine and melt the inside of Io and squeeze out all these volcanoes. Europa is probably the moon that gets the most press. It is an ice moon, totally covered with frozen water. That brown stuff there, we're not sure what that is. It might actually be some kind of algae growing in the low areas of the, of the moon, or it might just be dirt, we don't know. But Europa is one of the places that we actually think there could be life elsewhere in the solar system. Here's sort of some close-ups of, of the cracks in the ice and all these little brown uh, features. Underneath the ice, I think we've talked about this before, there's an ocean of liquid water and there's more water on Europa than there is on the planet Earth. So this massive ocean could have all sorts of um, activity in it. I'm really looking forward to when we build a spacecraft that goes there um, and allows us to basically go through the ice and then send a little submarine out and sort of check things out. There's probably little volcanoes at the bottom. That's where you would expect to find any kind of life. That'll be a very, very interesting um, mission when that finally happens. And there's just a, again, just a size comparison, a little bit smaller than our moon. Number three, Callisto. Callisto is kind of special because it is the moon with the oldest surface on in, in the Jupiter system. The It's totally covered with craters and, and there hasn't been any kind of ice uh, glaciers or volcanoes or anything like that that has reshaped the surface. So this is like a museum of craters that's been there for four and a half billion years or so. So Callisto is a pretty interesting moon as well. It might have an ocean underneath it's actually got a little bit of an atmosphere, which um, I didn't even realize. I, I, I knew that the moons were, were interesting, but I didn't realize that uh, it actually had some, some atmosphere. It's bigger than our moon, and uh, it gives you a sense of it. They're actually saying that, you know, if we eventually send people to the Jupiter system, they're obviously not going to go to Jupiter itself because it's a cloud planet. You can't really land, but you can land on one of the moons. And Callisto sounds like the best one. It's got all these... Um, big craters that have nice flat areas. It doesn't have any of the, the dangerous ice chasms that you see on Europa or things like that. And it would be the perfect place to set up uh, a base in the Jupiter system. So you send some robots that can take the ice and break it down and melt the, melt the ice into water, turn that into hydrogen and oxygen, which is rocket fuel and air. And you got all the things that you uh, need to survive. At least that's the theory. I'll be pretty interesting to see if um, if that is the uh, something that happens anytime soon. Okay, last one, Ganymede. Ganymede is a strange moon. It's an ice moon. It's got this weird terrain where one side of it is kind of dark and the other side is much lighter. As it goes around Jupiter, it's actually picking up dust and materials and getting darker on the side that faces sort of the front. It's bigger than Mercury. It's bigger than our moon. It's 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 a basically a planet in orbit around Jupiter. So Ganymede also has an ocean, also has an atmosphere. The atmosphere contains oxygen. That, that blows me away. You know, there's a, there's a place out there, almost a billion kilometers from the sun, and it's got oxygen and water. I mean, that's a pretty good start for life. It also has northern lights, although. The northern lights on Ganymede aren't really northern lights. They, they don't happen at the North Pole. They happen kind of in these two bands across the middle there. Ganymede is big enough that its middle is molten and it's made of iron, rather like the Earth's inner core. So these things that we think of as you know moons, they have really, really complex systems. And so Ganymede's another place where potentially you might find some form of life. Now there's a whole bunch of other moons, like I say, 79. Most of them are tiny little things. Probably half of them, we can only see them as dots. We don't even have good pictures of them. We just know that they're there by, by seeing the dots that slowly move around Jupiter. So those four big ones, those are sort of the, the nice uh, photogenic ones with nice pictures and stuff like that. Um, and uh, hopefully that will that will change as we get more spacecraft out to the Jupiter system. Okay, let's see. Um, 
I, I saw a couple of questions here. Um, Melissa said, if Galileo documented the moons, did he, did he name the moons of Jupiter? Interestingly, he called them the Medician stars because he was working for uh, the Medicis in, uh, in Venice. And uh, again, sort of a little bit of a patronage kind of thing. That name never caught on. And eventually they were named after the, uh, the various uh, mythological creatures uh, or mythological characters, sorry. And then the uh, Brooke was asking, do any of the moons come close enough to, to collide or anything like that? No, not so much. They're all in pretty stable orbits. Anything that was gonna collide has already collided in a long, long time, a long, long time ago, because um, the solar system has been around for four and a half billion years. And, and we've only been watching really for a few hundred years. So it is definitely um, just a small snapshot. The odds of something happening right now that isn't stable is really, really rare. Uh, and let's see, um, Lucy just asked, are the Northern Lights um, less extravagant because it's so far from the sun? The Northern Lights on Ganymede, you wouldn't be able to see with the human eye, unfortunately. They happen in the ultraviolet, and so you wouldn't see them at all. We can detect them with spacecraft, but unfortunately it wouldn't be a nice pretty view like we have. Um, and the temperature out on these moons is very cold. You're very, very far from the sun and you wind up having temperatures of minus 150 degrees Celsius or so. At that temperature, the water that has frozen into ice is as hard as steel or as hard as rock. So when we say that's an ice moon, it doesn't mean it's like a snowball where things are all sort of moving around. That ice is rock hard. Okay, um, let's see, we talked about Jupiter and uh, I know people are still keen on Mars. So we do have a couple of updates for Mars. So I think it's time. Cool space stuff. So Perseverance, Percy, and Ingenuity, the helicopter, Ginny, still doing their thing up there. Uh, there hasn't been another flight yet but uh, in the last week, but uh, some interesting science coming back and some images and things like that. But they're no longer alone on Mars. The Chinese spacecraft, um, Zhurong, uh, landed the day after last week's show. And they, they didn't tell us anything that it was gonna happen or anything like that. So we found out after the fact, but the spacecraft landed. This is the little ramp that the uh, car is gonna sort of drive down onto the surface there. There was another image where they got a picture of uh, the solar panels have all opened up on the little rover. And there's, you can see the Martian surface in the background. So hopefully that is gonna be uh, a bunch more pictures coming. It's always exciting to see another country get involved. In, in space exploration. Uh, China is only the third country to land something on Mars like this, um, and really only the second. The Americans have done it. The Soviet Union landed a probe in uh, the early 70s called Mars 3, and it had a tiny little rover about the size of a, like a shoebox. The rover, we don't know if it worked though, because the communication system of that spacecraft shut down after 20 seconds. So technically the rover got there, but it didn't really do anything useful, unfortunately. So China's really the, the second functional rover on Mars. So it's nice to see that going on and um, still no other pictures from the, uh, from the United Arab Emirates spacecraft, uh, Al Amal, that is still in orbit around Mars, taking uh, pictures and things like that, doing science, but they haven't really released a lot of stuff, in fact, there hasn't been much information at all on that. So I'm, uh, I'm, I hope everything is, is okay with that spacecraft. Let's see here. Um, I think we have a few, we're, well, we're gonna go to Q and A. So Mike, if you wanna start getting those ready, I've got a few of the Oakenwald questions to uh, take a look at. Um, our friend uh, Jane at Oakenwald asked, uh, are there clouds on Mars? And the answer is, yes, there are. This is a picture of some of the clouds in the sky on Mars. And we can see them from the ground, from the rovers. We can also see them from orbit. Here you can see some white clouds. Often they form right around these big mountains or volcanoes, but sometimes you get clouds that form over other parts of the, uh, of the planet as well. Now those are the, the atmospheric clouds. You also get 
other kinds of clouds that will form sometimes dust clouds where the wind just picks up the dust and makes dust devils that whirls the dust into the atmosphere and you get this huge cloud of dust. So that's a different kind of thing that happens very infrequently. So definitely, uh, definitely a different thing. Uh, Jedediah was asking, was there water on Mars? We're pretty sure that there was water on Mars because the whole surface of Mars is covered with dried up riverbeds, dried up lake beds, dried up oceans, basically. The Mars was probably half covered with water at some point in its history. All the water's gone now though. It might've soaked into the ground. It might've evaporated out into space. It might, some of it is frozen and is found in ice near the ice caps and things like that, but there's a lot of water missing. So that's one of the big mysteries about Mars. And uh, one of the things we're trying to, uh, trying to answer with these rovers. We also had another question from, oops, from Oakenwald. Um, oh, also from Jane, how many moons does Mars have? So Mars has two moons, but they're, they're not big moons like our moon. They're tiny little potatoes, basically. The, they're called Phobos and Deimos. And Phobos is only 11 kilometers across. So if you took that and put it down here on Earth, it would be like the middle of Winnipeg basically. And uh, Deimos is only six kilometers across. So that's like, I don't know, St. Vitale and Fort Gary put together something like that, just a small area of the city. Whereas if you brought the Earth's moon down here, it would be the size of Australia or bigger than that even. So these are really, really tiny things. And in fact, we think that they are um, captured asteroids. The little rocks that are out there in the asteroid belt, some of them have occasionally come close to a planet. We think these are probably captured uh, asteroids. And interestingly, they're slowly spiraling in. So at some point in the next few hundred thousand years, um, uh, Phobos here is actually gonna impact the surface and go from being a moon of Mars to being a crater on Mars because it'll just blow up and make a huge, uh, a huge mess. So that's uh, another question from Jane. And then we had, uh, um, another Oakenwald, when will NASA start putting people on Mars? Well, not for a while yet. Um, it always seems to be 20 years in the future. It's been 20 years in the future since I was a kid. Oh yeah, we'll be on Mars in 20 years, they said in the 80s and then in the 90s and then in the 2000s. And sometimes they'll bump it forward. Oh, we'll be on Mars in 10 years. But then those 10 years go by and, we'll, and they'll say, oh, well, we're not quite there yet. So there is really a lot of work to, to go before we can send people people to Mars. It's a long trip. It's a complicated trip. It's a dangerous trip. And it's not the kind of thing you want to rush. Um, let's see, one more question, and then I'll throw it to you, Mike. Uh, Sasha from Oakenwald is saying, why does NASA put their Mars pictures straight on the internet? You might not know this, but the images that come from Mars don't go into a scientist's lab at NASA somewhere. They get put on a server that is immediately available on the internet. So you can literally be the first person to see a picture that comes down. I mean, if you happen to download it at exactly the right moment. It's just easier to, to make them available right away rather than to make them, you know, some kind of delay or things like that. Now you have to understand that most pictures like the ones that we see, like this one, that's not how it comes from the camera. It's not like an iPhone up there that does all this processing. There's a huge amount of processing to make it look like this. So there's a lot of, it's all black and white. Some of the things need to be calibrated or adjusted or things like that, but you can literally see all of those things. NASA does it that way so that anybody, you, me, anyone can be a Mars explorer. You don't have to work at NASA. You can basically take a look and see what you can discover. And people have found some interesting stuff. Somebody found a meteorite on Mars that uh, they sort of noticed in the background uh, on one of the previous missions, just because they happened to be looking at the pictures and were, were looking, the, the scientists were concentrated on the foreground and the, someone found this thing in the background. So that's why they do it. So everybody can sort of share in our, in our exploration of Mars. Okay, Mike, uh, let's throw it to you for questions. What else do we have? Yeah, I want to go back to some of the earlier questions uh, that we were getting because we did promise to answer a few of them. Uh, Vivian was wondering, uh, have any probes or landers gone specifically to the moons of Mars or Jupiter um, rather than just to the planet itself? 
Well, there was the intention to. The, the Russians in 1996 had two spacecraft that were going to go to the moon Phobos. They were going to go into orbit around Mars, and then they were going to go into orbit around Phobos and eventually land there. Uh, both of those spacecraft failed en route. Um, in the 90s, after the Soviet Union broke up, the, the budget situation in the Russian space probe uh, business was not the best. And they had a lot, of, uh, a lot of failures right around that time. So unfortunately, nobody's tried it since, but I'm sure we will. Uh, okay, we're going to get topics all over the board here. Uh, ben was wondering, what do you think of the idea that the moon may be hollow as NASA has measured the reverberations uh, when they have crashed objects into it? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a common, um, well, not a common question, but the, the idea isn't that the moon is necessarily hollow. Um, I think that's that comes from the media where you sort of think that, oh, if you hit something like a bell, it reverberates and you get this kind of tone um, and the bell is hollow. The moon reverberates even though it's not hollow. It's a, it's a solid rock, but it doesn't have to be hollow to still carry sound. Like, like earthquakes here on the earth, for example, they go right through the earth even though it's not hollow. So we're pretty sure the, the moon is not hollow. We think that the, the, the moon has a, a quite heavy core that is offset a little bit. And that's why the moon actually uh, keeps one side facing us all the time. It's kind of like, if you're old enough, you might remember those weebles. It's like a little oval shaped person and you, they were weighted at the bottom and you could push, push them over and they'd come back up. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Anybody remember that? I don't know. The moon is kind of like that. So it's got a weight in it that is offset. So we're pretty sure the moon isn't hollow. That's, uh, that's the latest. Okay. Uh, Brooke uh, was commenting that two weeks ago, uh, they saw at least 30 objects fly through the sky straight overhead at around midnight. They were all evenly spaced and traveling west to east. Could they have been a caravan of satellites? That's exactly what they were. Those are the space, SpaceX uh, Starlink satellites. They launched them in batches of 60. The rocket goes up and spits them all out. And so they start off in a line, a very small line. And as they go around the Earth, they start to spread out. And so after a few orbits, they're, they're in that sort of caravan view like you, like you saw. And then a few more orbits, they're quite far away from each other. And eventually, like one will appear and disappear and then the next will appear and disappear and they'll they'll spread out quite a bit they're launching those things every couple of weeks so there's a lot of them up there in fact especially right around now because we have sort of the uh the perfect conditions for seeing satellites you'll probably see a lot of those where you'll see multiple satellites going along those are all starlink and i blame elon musk for those all right uh, August and Lucy were wondering what would constellations look like on other planets? Oh, that's a great question. You know, it's funny. I always thought that, you know, you go to Mars or Pluto or something and, and the sky would look different. The sky would look different because you're farther from the sun and all that kind of stuff. But the stars are so far away that the Big Dipper would still look like the Big Dipper, even if you were way out on Pluto. Because going all the way out to Pluto, 5 billion kilometers, that's still a small amount compared to the vast distances out to the stars. You would have to travel light years away before you'd really get major changes in our, in our constellations. So that's actually kind of useful. Anywhere in our solar system, the constellations will look the same. Um, you just get a different view of them depending on where you were on the planet. Just like Australia has a different view than Manitoba. We're still seeing the same constellations. They're just tilted differently and, and so on. So that's uh, anywhere in the solar system, all of our constellations will still be good. So many questions we're getting tonight. I'm, I'm still 20 minutes behind on, on catching up on questions here, but uh, Kaylee actually had a really good one when you were talking about Jupiter. I wanted to get it out there. Uh, they were asking, why doesn't the, the great red spot, the, the giant storm on Jupiter, why doesn't that stop? Well, um, if you knew that, you'd probably get a Nobel Prize because that's, that's a big question. We know that storms on Earth, of course, eventually they run out of energy and they stop. Um, does that happen for, uh, for the Great Red Spot? Maybe it will one day. We just haven't seen it yet. But 
Jupiter is really, really fast. And that whips up the winds and the winds go really, really fast. And so when you've got that much wind going all the time, all across the planet, and there's no mountains or valleys or, or things like that for the, the weather to sort of hit up against and then stop. There's no lakes, there's no oceans that would change the weather. It's kind of the same all around the planet. It's all clouds. That lets the, the weather last a whole lot longer. We think that's the answer, but until we actually see one of those storms stop, we really won't know. Mm -hmm. uh, oh boy, where do I want to go to next? Oh, I just want to mention uh, in uh, Kaylee, uh, who just asked that question, uh, one of our longtime viewers of uh, Dome at Home uh, sent us an email uh, right after I said uh, our email address. Uh, and uh, Kaylee was wondering if we could ever do a show on jobs in the space area, like astronauts, astronomers, astrophysicists. Sounds like we got someone who might be interested in a job a in astronomy idea. and space. I think that's amazing, Kaylee. Thank you for doing yeah. that and sending us that email. Fantastic. And we will, uh, we will either do that in a show or we will find another way to do it because I think that's a great reference uh, resource for people like you that are, that are interested in doing this kind of stuff. Um, the other thing that I could recommend is that there is an astronomy club in town that's uh, interested in backyard astronomy. So if you, uh, you don't have to have a telescope or anything like that, but there's a, they're called the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And once a month, they have a Zoom meeting like this where they're talking about, you know, the latest discoveries or different telescopes or all sorts of things. Once COVID is over, they have an observatory, they have a library full of telescopes that people can take out uh, from month to month to, to sort of test drive telescopes and stuff like that. Fantastic group. Um, I've been a member since I was 16, I think. And it's, uh, it's a great way to sort of get to know other people that know this, that are interested in the sky. So that's something to check out. Uh, RASC.ca is the, uh, is the website. And there's, there's actually stuff all across. It's not just here in Winnipeg. It's pretty much every major city in Canada has a, has a chapter of that group. So that's another resource. Um, and I think finally, if you, if, if you don't have the book Night Watch by Terrence Dickinson, that's a great book. That's, that's my go-to book for learning about astronomy uh, and learning about how to see things in the sky because it's a, it's a great resource. has a little bit of everything and um, it's probably good training for anybody that uh, has an interest in an astronomy kind of career. Okay, uh, how much time do we got here? Mike, you can give us questions until we're out. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I want to keep going a little bit just because uh, there are some great questions. Uh, Miller was asking uh, on uh, Zoom here, uh, there are a lot of craters on the moon. Do we know how many craters are on the moon? I don't think anyone's ever asked me that. Um, wow, short answer. I have no idea. Um, and we, we do know that there's probably three or 4,000 craters that you can see in a, in a telescope from Earth. But there's way more than that. We can only see things down to about one kilometer across. So anything smaller than that, smaller craters, we just can't see from here. And when the Apollo astronauts were there, they found craters that were all the way down to like the size of a dinner plate. Every time something hits the moon, it leaves a crater. Even a tiny little piece of dust would leave a, a microscopic crater. So I guess the easy answer is there's millions and millions of craters there. Uh, and some of them are just so small that we haven't been able to see them. Well, according to the interwebs, uh, and of course, this is uh, tempered by the fact that these are ones that are only visible, not like the micro ones that you were referring to, but uh, apparently there are 9,137 craters on the surface of the moon that is recognized by the International Astronomical Union. So, ah, uh, yes, those are the named ones. So each one of those has a name, and uh, that's great. I was I was going to say I'm going to have to look that up, and we'll get it to you next time around. But yeah. Mike, you beat me to it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. 9,137? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, boy. The questions keep coming here. Um, I'm just going to throw this one out to you, Scott, because I'm, I, I'm, I'm not too sure. Uh, it's, Lucy was asking, if Jupiter was heated up to room temperature, would it change shape or size? And I'm kind of boggled by that question myself. Hmm. Well, if it was heated up... 
Hmm. I'm going to have to fall back on my theoretical physics here. Um, if you heat up a gas, it expands. So Jupiter would get bigger. If you could somehow heat it up evenly, it should expand evenly and it should be basically, um, I wonder how much bigger, probably a few times bigger than it currently is, I would guess. That's just a guess though. Um, Cause that's heating it up probably a hundred, 120 degrees or so. Um, but it should maintain its shape. Um, although it might expand so much that the outer layers would start to get away because the gravity wouldn't be strong enough anymore and it would sort of start to evaporate. So I think if you heated up Jupiter, you would actually cause a chain reaction and it would evaporate away into nothing. So, uh, so please don't. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a great question though. Yeah. Um, and maybe one final question. I, I, I'm unfortunate we're just going to run out of time. Uh, and I know you've told this story on uh, past episodes and you'll probably tell it again when we have a, an episode on a solar eclipse uh, coming up. Uh, but uh, Ryan was wondering, what is the story about why you became an astronomer? Oh, um, yeah. Well, in, in 1979, there was a solar eclipse that came through Winnipeg. And somehow my parents knew that you were able to look at the very total part, the, the two minutes in the middle where the moon is blocking the sun completely. You were able to look at that safely. But the school was going to keep us inside the gym and make us watch the whole thing on TV because it's too complicated to get kids outside and don't look yet don't look yet. Now you can look, you know, it's too much of a mess. So she called me in sick and uh, I stayed at home and I watched it in their bedroom on a black and white television. But then during the uh, total phase on the TV, the moon covers up the sun, you get this ghostly ring around the outside. We opened up the blinds and we looked outside and there was this magical hole in the sky. It looked like a black hole surrounded by blue fire and then all the way around in the sky, it was like sunset and sunrise in all directions at the same time. It was a truly magical sight. The birds started quieting down. People were turning their headlights on as they were driving by. Can't believe someone would be driving by and not notice a solar eclipse, but whatever. Um, and so I got to see this for two minutes and 11 seconds or whatever it was. And at that point, I was an astronomer at 11, 16 in the morning, February 26, 1979, I found what I was going to be. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what an astronomer did. I just knew that I had to know more about this. And that was sort of my, uh, I celebrate that as sort of my anniversary of, uh, of becoming an astronomer. So Nice. I always um, like hearing that story. I've, I've heard yeah, you tell that story quite a number of times. Yeah, it's a fun story. And it, uh, I mean, everybody fi can find their own thing. For me, it was seeing a solar eclipse. For someone else, it's um, swimming with dolphins or watching, uh, going up into the mountains or whatever, you know, everybody has a, a thing that will inspire them. And so that's, that's what we try and provide for, for our kids and for families and things like that. And, uh, you never know what someone's going to get excited about. And it doesn't have to be when you're eight years old. It can be when you're 58 years old or 88 years old. It doesn't, uh, doesn't matter. Inspiration can strike anytime. Kaylee saying we are, uh, hers is visiting with the planetarium. Yes, 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 oh, yes. Sweet. Yes. You know, can sweet. Put that on a postcard and send it to our bosses. <laughs> 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 yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's really gratifying to hear that this, uh, that this kind of stuff happens uh, and that people get excited because that's really why, uh, why Mike and I are doing this. So we will get out into, the, uh, into Facebook land and YouTube land and answer a few more of the questions. I know we didn't get to all the ones on Zoom. We just got overwhelmed. We're, uh, we were up over 100 uh, people in Zoom today and then all the Facebook and all the YouTube. So uh, great questions. Bring them back next week. We'll be in next week. Um, we'll be looking at the summer triangle. We're gearing up for summertime. And we'll also hopefully have some pictures of the lunar eclipse, which will occur the day before our next show. Um, plus, of course, Skywatch and cool space stuff and any other things that happen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming out. Again, thanks to Steinbeck Credit Union for sponsoring the show. Mike, have a good week, and we'll see you next time around.